water level gets, the faster it seems to drain away until finally that last bit of water disappears in that ferocious little whirlpool as it goes down the drain. And when I was a child full of years, each year just dragged by slowly. But you know what? The older I get, the faster time goes by. And I know that what's true for me is true for you too because I've heard you guys say that to me over the years as well. And that's why beginning here in the year 2015, we are talking about time and how we spend it. We're in the second part of this series, Time and Life. And uh, if you've got those study guide books that I put together, we're on sermon number two, so you can open up to that. You can write down any notes that you want. But um, last week we began with the unsettling truth that all of us have a limited amount of time, right? And none of us knows how many years that we have. And so we looked at a psalm that Moses wrote, and it was a prayer really teaching us that we need to number our days so that we can gain a heart of wisdom. And if we live in light of the fact that our days are numbered, then we're going to make better decisions because none of us wants to waste our life, right? This isn't a depressing thought. It actually helps us to leverage our time so that we have a better sense of purpose and a better sense of God's destiny for us. And today I want to talk specifically about how to get the most out of your time. There's this simple principle that perhaps you've heard before, and the interesting thing is, it's in the Bible. It's in both the Old and the New Testaments, actually. And to introduce you to this principle, I want to show you a video called The Empty Pickle Jar, A Lesson on Life. So we're going to watch this video clip. It's about three minutes long, and then we're going to talk about that and what it means. So go ahead and roll it, man. <coughs>
truth to that, huh? Yes. It, it, it's interesting how they compare our, our life and our time to a jar that's being filled. Of course, that jar in, in the illustration, it can uh, represent any allotment of time. It could represent a day or a week, or it could represent maybe a lifetime or a certain season of life that you're in. And you can get a lot into that jar when everything is put in in the proper order with those bigger things going in first and then the smaller things all kind of going in around that. But you know what? If you start out with your jar already half full of those pebbles and sand, guess what? You're not going to be able to fit the bigger things in, like the golf balls. You'll be able to get some of those in, but not all of them. And if those are the important things of life and they're left out, Guess what? That's when you start living with regrets. All the pebbles and the sand in the jar, they represent the semi-important things in life, as well as maybe the fun things that you do and, and the cool things that, you know, maybe they just basically waste your time. These are things that aren't necessarily important to your success, but you don't want to give them up. Now, for some of you, about half of the pebbles and sand in that jar represents Facebook. We won't, we won't go there, but you know who you are. Or, or maybe, the, maybe the pebbles and sand represent shopping online, or maybe they represent driving through car lots and looking at cars that you know you can't afford, or maybe driving through all those neighborhoods and looking at the houses that you can't buy. And uh, maybe those pebbles and sand represent you know, staying out too late with friends, or, or maybe it represents that extra game of golf or that extra game of PlayStation. Maybe the pebbles and sand represent all the TV that you watch or the internet that you surf. It represents all that stuff that fills up your time, and sometimes it's important, but most of the times they are not critical to your success or your well-being. But then there are the golf balls, right? Or as the story is told by Stephen Covey back in the 1980s, he's the one who originated this whole story. He said there are the big rocks in your life. And these big rocks represent the important things, okay? So if you've got kids, obviously, you're going to put them in your time and life jar. They're important. They're big rocks. And then for those of you who are married, you know, there's the big rock that represents your spouse. Or maybe if you don't want to be offensive, you put in a smaller rock representing your spouse because you're not trying to imply that they need to lose weight or anything like that, right? <laughs> But the point is you want to make sure that there is time and life for your spouse. And then there are those bigger rocks that represent your work and all the time that you spend on the job. And then there are those bigger rocks if you're going to school, if you're a student, that represent the time you spend with your studies. And there's the big rock of your church life or your life group. There's the big rock that is your, represents your exercise routine or the leisure time rock. All of these things have to fit in within the course of a day, or a month, or a year, or a lifetime. And when everything fits in properly, that's good, right? The problem is that for many of us, we don't have our priorities in the right order. We would rather just play in the sand all the time instead of building our life on the rock. And so that's when we say that something's important. We say that it's a big rock, but then we get to the end of our day or the end of our week or the end of a lifetime or a season in life and we realize there just wasn't enough time to fit that in and we kind of look back and that's when you're going, wow, you know what, my kids are all grown up and they're gone now and, and uh, I missed too many dinners at home and I missed too many ball games with them. There just wasn't enough time to get it all in and, and stays outside of the jar. Well, the point that we want to make today as we continue in this talk on time and life is simply this. The key to getting more accomplished in your life, to getting as much done as possible, is not just adding more in and running around faster and faster and just stressing yourself out. The key to getting as much as possible done in your life is to have your priorities right. In fact, the principle that I want to leave with you today is simply this. Priority determines capacity. In fact, would you say that with me right now? Priority determines capacity. It's true. It's what you put in first that ultimately determines the capacity of your life and the capacity of your time. And it's pretty amazing because 
Once you have determined what your priorities are, what the big rocks in life are going to be, it is amazing how all that other stuff has a way of fitting in too. Facebook and golf and internet and hanging out with friends and shopping and looking at cars. All that cool stuff that you know isn't critical to your life, but so often if we're not intentional, those are the little things that push out the big things and, and we end up with regret. Priority determines capacity. The priorities of your life determine the capacity of your time, whether it's a day or whether it's a lifetime. And that's probably not new information, but the question is, why don't we live this way? You see, the question is, why don't we put the big rocks in first? And I think the reason why most of us, most of the time, don't do that, we don't prioritize, is we've never really sat down and asked ourselves the question, what are the big rocks in my life? What, what is really important to me? What are the things that when I get to the end of this week or the end of this year, the end of this season in my life, the end of my education, when I end, get to the end of the first few years of my marriage, what are the things that I want to be able to look back and, on and say, you know what, I don't have any regrets because I put those things in first. They were the priority in my life. And I didn't fit, I'm not missing anything that's important. But along with that question of what's most important, is the question, who is most important? And if you're married, he or she's a big rock, right? In fact, why don't you take a moment right now, look at your spouse and say, baby, you're my big rock. <laughs> baby, you're my big rock. <laughs> or if you're sitting with your kids, you know that they are big rocks, right? Not in the sense of holding you down or holding you back, but in the sense that they are important. They are big pieces of your life. And the interesting thing about busyness and running around and getting all stressed out when you're forcing things in and you're cramming things in all the time without prioritizing is busyness and that mad dash, it, it will ultimately destroy intimacy. It will ultimately destroy and remove all the things that are important from your life. But chances are there's room for everything you need in your day. There's, there's room for everything you need in your week if you begin to prioritize correctly. And if we don't decide ahead of time what's important, you will come to the end of your day or the end of a season in life, you will come to the end of high school or college or the first 20 years of your marriage or the first 20 years of your career and you will look back and say, wow, I wish I could go back and recapture that. Wow, I wish I could go back and do that over again. I have some regrets. If you put the wrong things in first, you will not be able to put in all of the important things, the things that you say really matter. So this whole discussion about priorities, it begins for all of us with this question, what and who is really important to you? And what would that look like in your day or in your week or in your month or year or the season of life you're in to prioritize correctly and put all those things or put all those people that are important ahead of the things that are less important. How would that <coughs> rearrange your schedule? What would you have to quit doing? How would your calendar look different? What would you need to rearrange in your week? Or even what would you need to rearrange this afternoon with your schedule if you prioritized correctly? Because priority determines capacity every time, right? Now at this point in the discussion, we come to a fork in the road because I know that there are two groups of people who are listening to me right now. For those of you who would say, you know, Tyler, I, I may be attending church, but I'm really not a churchy kind of person. You know, I'm here because somebody promised me lunch afterwards, or I'm here because somebody said I'd meet somebody cute. You know, I'm really not into this whole church thing, right? Well, if that's you, then your application for this message is really quite simple. And what you need to do is just start making a list of the things that are important to you because we're at the beginning of a new year, right? And it's the perfect time to do that because we usually don't do that in an intentional way. Figure out what are those big rocks that you need to put in first into your life and get those in. But then for those of us who would say we are following Christ to the very best of our ability, there is another component here that is absolutely huge. In the Old and New Testament, we are told very specifically that we are to put God into the jar first. 
that there is a God rock that is to be a priority, and everything else in our life is ultimately organized around who? God. Around him, that's right. Now, if this idea of a God rock sounds sacrilegious to you, consider this. Moses and David referred to God as a rock. In Psalm 18, verse 31, for instance, we read this. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? They even put a capital R on rock to make it look good and let you know that this is important. This is a reference to God, right? Who is the rock except our God? Now, when you open up your Bible and you start to read about this idea of priorities, here's something that you don't find. You don't find the word priority or prioritize as such. The Bible's word for priority is the word seek. Seek God first. And so this was the Bible's way of saying you need to put God first in the jar. God is the organizing factor. He is the first rock that you put in. He is the one who determines all of our other priorities. So whenever you see the word seek in the Bible, I want you to think of the word prioritize or priority. So, for instance, in Psalm 63, verse 1, it says, O oh God, you are my rock, earnestly I seek you. In other words, seeking God was a priority for David. Or another example is in Psalm 119, verse 10, where we read, I seek you with all my heart, do not let me stray from your commands. Seeking God and obeying his commands, they go hand in hand. And so David is saying, by seeking you with all my heart, I am prioritizing you over all these other things. I am reordering the way I live my life because your commands are the priority and they inform every single decision I make. In Proverbs 28, verse 5, it says, Evildoers do not understand what is right, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. In other words, he says that to understand what is right, to understand what is good, we must seek God. We must put God first in the jar. And to the best of my ability, I must be faithful to him as a priority. But here's the thing. We know we have gone through seasons in life, right, where maybe God wasn't the priority. We didn't put God first, and it led to some indiscretions, and it led to sin, and it led to some wrong choices, and it resulted in terrible consequences. And you know, probably most of the unpleasant things we experience in life, they could be traced back to not making God the priority. They could be traced back to not seeking Him. Not everything, but most things. And if it wasn't us who wasn't putting God first, maybe it was somebody else and we, we suffered because of their consequences or, or the result of something that they did. You know, Jesus emphasized the importance of seeking God first in his Sermon on the Mount. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 31 through 33, we come across this text that is so central to everything we believe as Christians. This is what Jesus said. He said... Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Now that's a big rock, right? What shall we eat? And then he says, what shall we drink? There's another big rock. You've got to put that in the jar. What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? That's definitely a big rock for many of us. We spend a lot of time and money on, you know, what we're going to wear. And Jesus says we're not to obsess over that. But he goes on and says... For the pagans, and a pagan was basically someone who lives as though God doesn't exist, right? He says, for the pagans run after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now, here's something for every Christian to think about. Do you really believe that your Heavenly Father knows what you need? I mean, don't just say yes because we're in church right now. But do you really believe that... Your Heavenly Father knows everything you need. All the things that you try to cram into your day and week, all the things that you, try to, that you worry about fitting in, do you really believe He knows what you need? Because see, if you really believe that God knows what you need, then why in the world do we not put Him in the jar first? Why do we not put God first in our lives? So Jesus draws a conclusion then in verse 33. He says, but seek first or prioritize first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all these things will be given to you as well. Now we are to seek God in and 
then all these other priorities and these things that you need, they will be given to you as well. God is able to do that if you put him first. Now, one of the best ways to demonstrate and express that priority is to devote to God every single day, the first few minutes of your day. And when you do that, it is like saying, God, I'm going to put you first. Okay, I'm giving you my first few minutes at the beginning of my day in recognition of the fact that you are central to my life. And here's what I've discovered, and I know that many of you have discovered this as well. When I say yes to God at the beginning of my day, it is easier for me to say no to all those other little things that would distract me from what is most important in life. And when I say yes to God at the beginning of my day, it is easier for me to say yes, even when God brings in interruptions that, you know, for me, it just annoys me or whatever. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to be able to finish what's on my to-do list. When I give God those first few minutes of my day in prayer and scripture reading or whatever routine you choose to develop, it is far easier for me to not worry about all the things that, that don't fit into my jar that day because I can live with a sense that, God, I have devoted this day to you. You knew the interruptions that would come. You knew what needed to be done. You can handle it even when I think that I can't. And when you say yes to God at the beginning of every day, it will give you greater insight as to what to include in your time in life and what to leave out. Martin Luther once said, pray and let God worry. And the way that played out for Luther is that on those days when he had the most to do, he would get up extra early and he would devote even more time to prayer. Isn't that interesting? Because what do I hear from, from us a lot of times is, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read God's word. He would get up earlier and devote even more time to prayer on those days when he was busier. Because this is what he said, the busier his day was, he knew that he needed to pray more so he could ensure that as he moved through the worries of his day, he knew that he was, in fact, doing God's will. And he would never lose sight of that. When I begin my day by saying yes to God, I worry less. Now let me just ask you a question at this point. For those of you who have a consistent morning devotional life, for those of you who would say that on the days you are consistent in your prayer life and you are consistent in your devotional life, how many of you would say that you worry less and it's easier to say no to all those things that would distract you from what's most important? How many of you have experienced that in your life? Some of you, okay. It is a principle of life that is true. Yeah. Now I realize that for some of you, you have to get up and shower first thing in the morning, or you need to get up and you need to get that first cup of coffee in you uh, first thing in the morning. And, I, and I'm not saying that you have to drop to your knees the moment you wake up and you're on the edge of your bed. In fact, if some of you did that, it would freak out your spouse and your kids, right? You get up and you get on your knees and you raise your hand in there and go, God, I devote this day to you. Your, your family would be going, what is wrong with him? <laughs> but here's my point. According to your personality, according to your routine, right? Figure out how to devote those first few minutes of every day to God. Figure out what that is for you. Because your first few minutes of your day, it will set the direction and the attitude and the whole tone of your day. And what I know is this. On the days that I faithfully devote those first few minutes to my Heavenly Father, it is far easier for me to stay focused on the things that really need my attention and to say no to those things that would distract me from what I know in my heart is most important. Now there are so many different ways that you can devote your time and life to God. So many different tools that are out there to help you. For instance, there are devotional books that you can purchase. There's the gift and Bible stores in Lansing, or there's those uh, Christian book distributor catalogs, um, and they have all kinds of devotions in them. You can find resources from the Christian Standard and the Lookout. In fact, we give those hard copies of those away every week, or you can get online for the Christian Standard and the Lookout, and you can find a tab up there that deals just with devotions and start your day with that. <coughs> We give away copies of our daily bread for free every quarter. In fact, I know there's a couple of copies still out there on the entryway table. Those, those little devotionals, our daily bread, those are one of my favorite ways to connect with God first thing in the morning. Gives you a scripture to read, gives you a little thought that ties in with that scripture and how to apply it to your life. 
And if you like, you can even follow their plan for reading through the whole Bible in a year. So if you read those, those little passages of Scripture every day, by the time you get done with a year, you will have read through the whole entire Bible. How would you like to be able to say you accomplished that at the end of this year? Or for a time of prayer each day? You could pray through the Psalms as using those as a pattern for your prayer. Did you know the Psalms are basically prayers and they are songs of praise to God? Or you could even use the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us. I'll tell you, Craig did an outstanding job with the Sunday School lesson this morning, teaching on this very thing that I'm about to mention to you, how you can use the Lord's Prayer as a pattern for how to pray through, pray to God and connect with Him each day. You basically just use that as a guide for your major thoughts as you work through it and you create your own version of it. It might go something like this. You know how it starts out, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And, and so basically you are acknowledging that God, you are great and you are holy. And, and so in your first few minutes, you can just declare that to God. I recognize you as sovereign and holy and great. And you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so I submit my life to you. I, I make you the priority of my life because I want to do your will. And then you could say something to God, like, God, I, I, I give you my hands, and I give you my lips, and I give you my eyes, and I give you my ears. I'm giving all this back to you today because I don't know how my day is going to go. I, I know what's on my calendar, but I know that at the end of this day, the most important thing isn't that I got everything done, you know, and I can check it all off my list. The most important thing is that I've honored you with my time and life that you've given and at the end of the Lord's Prayer, it says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Give us this day our daily bread. And so at that point, you are basically recognizing your dependence on the Lord. Lord, I pray for my protection, and I pray for my provision, and I pray for my pardon from sin. And you know, every week, you guys get prayed for by name at least two or three times by me. I pray for you guys. I ask God to bring healing into your life. I ask God to bring his provision to you. I ask God to give you pardon for your sins. And you can be praying for our church as well. I pray for God to protect our church. You can pray for the people in your life group, in your Sunday school class. And so these are, are, are things that you can do to draw close to God. And you can do something like this as part of your routine every day. And here's what the Bible teaches. When it comes to time, if you will put the God rock in first, if you put it in first on a daily basis, it reorients your thinking and your life and your time around God's will that he has for you. Now, if you think that's kind of out there and you're thinking, ah, that's just kind of stupid, Tyler. Here's what I already know before you dismiss all of this. You are already seeking something first. You might not even know what it is. But if you want to know what you're seeking first, ask the people who know you best. Ask your spouse. Ask people who you spend time with. They'll tell you what you seek the most. They listen to the questions you ask because we tend to ask questions about that which we care about. They know what you worry about because we tend to worry about those things that are important to us. They know what you talk about because we tend to talk about that which is most important to us. They know what you spend your money on because we tend to spend money on that which is important to us. And so the people you live with, who you spend time with, who are married to you, they know what's most important to you. It might be wealth or it might be popularity or it might be getting up to a thousand friends on Facebook. It might be to be a, at a size four. It might be to improve my golf game or to buy the next PlayStation game that comes out. There is something in your life that you are seeking first. And my advice to you is, seek all that stuff if you want to, just don't seek it first, okay? Don't let it be the organizing principle around which all the rest of your time and affection and emotional life are organized. In fact, why not make an attempt to come to that place where you say, Heavenly Father, more than all that other stuff that I want, I really want to know and do your will. And as an expression of that desire, I am giving you the first few minutes of my life, and I'm saying to you, all my time belongs to you. 
I am reorienting all my thinking around you, Lord. And here's what will happen. You will become more productive because when you prioritize correctly, you have great capacity in your life. Think about all that Jesus was able to do in just three years of ministry. Here, 2,000 years later, we still quote him. 2,000 years later, we still follow him, right? And that was just because of three years of his ministry. When you prioritize correctly, your capacity in terms of your time increases. It will increase your productivity because there's more peace in your life. It will increase your productivity because you have a better sense of pacing. It will increase the productivity in your life because you will have a better sense of accomplishment at the end of the day when you realize, you know, maybe I didn't get everything done on my to-do list. Everything that I wanted to cram into my day. But God, to the best of my ability, I knew and I did your will for my life. And one thing you need to keep in mind is God's not going to force his way into your jar, right? When it comes to your time and life, God, the big rock, doesn't come crashing in. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it notes that Jesus, and I love that painting we have in, in the kitchen uh, meeting room there, that big picture on the wall, Jesus standing at the door knocking, and, and that's what that comes from Revelation, where he says, Behold, I stand at the door, and what's the next word? Knock. Okay? It's not, behold, I kick the door in and take over. <laughs> Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, I would like to be the big rock of your life. I would like to be put in first every day. I would like to be first in all of your relationships. And if you'll put me first, and if you'll prioritize correctly, then as Jesus said, all of these other things will be given to you as well. So, what would that look like in your life? with your schedule, with your personality, with the way you're wired? What would it look like for you to give God your first few minutes of every day? Think about that and make a decision. If you all agree that priority determines capacity, why would you not devote to God your first few minutes of every day as a God-fearing person? Because when you begin your day by saying yes to God, you will worry less. Because you will have invited God into your entire day. And maybe you could even pray through your schedule for the day. You know, there are times when I do that, when I'll just say, God, if you want me to get this done, or God, if you want me to meet with this person, please help me to get this project done right now that I might be struggling through. And it's not that I'm trying to tell God what to do, but I am acknowledging that God is present, and whatever happens, I am moving ahead with Him, and I'm moving ahead only where He is blessing. And when I'm intentional about my priorities, guess what? It helps me to have time for what's important, but it also leaves time for what's fun. Do you remember in the video that we watched at the beginning of the message? It ended with just the right amount of chocolate milk being poured into that jar representing your life. Do you remember that at the end? Well, because you've made it a priority to come to church today on this first Sunday in 2015, because you have made it a priority to come to church on this first day of the week to get in tune with God, because you have listened intently to the message this morning, I have a parting gift for you, chocolate. Everybody gets a candy bar, I feel like Oprah. Everybody gets a candy bar as you leave church today <laughs> as a reminder that life is sweeter and it functions more smoothly when your priorities are in order. So Nicole and Nick, would you please let them pick out a candy bar and let that be a reminder of how life is sweeter and functions more smoothly when your priorities are in order. And here's the thing. At the end of the day, my goal is to have lived the day in a way that pleases Jesus. Priority determines capacity. So what's most important to you? How do you get that into your jar first? Who's most important to you? And what would it look like for you to begin your day by devoting to your Heavenly Father the first few minutes of every day? Put God first, and it will be easier to prioritize everything else along the way. Would you just bow your heads and pray with me for a moment? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that teaches us the importance of seeking you first. And as we begin this new year, I pray for each and every person here, not only that your favor and blessing will go with them, but that they will truly put you first in their life, in their time, 
in their service, in their relationships, in their work, in their participation with your church. May you be glorified in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as our praise team comes up to the front, gets ready to close this out with a, a closing song, would you just stand with me here? And uh, as we close out, we always close out with a recognition that we have a decision to make, right? And for some of us, maybe, maybe we've never decided that, that God is going to be first. Maybe we've never decided to pledge our allegiance to Christ and, and to be buried with Him in baptism so we can be united with Him in His death and raised with Him in newness of life. And if you've never done that, we want to give you that opportunity today as we sing this closing song. I'll be standing right here, and all you need to do is come on down to the front. We'll talk about the next steps that you need to take to, to get right connected with, with God through Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you are already a Christian, you want to partner with us in ministry, we'd love to have you become a part of this church family and help us further the kingdom of God. And if that describes you and you want to pledge your allegiance to this church and commit to being a member, I'll be standing right here. All you got to do is come on down to the front as we sing this closing song. As we close this morning.